forth. There we go. Okay, a little plug for OFLA because they are hosting the platform. They're helping us run everything. So if you'd like to be a member, um, I know they would appreciate it. And I am then going to have Beth Henman and Carrie Durand introduce themselves. And I am going to stop talking and talking. let them take over. So Beth and Carrie, if you want to introduce yourselves and then go for Hi. it. Hi, well, I'm, hold on a sec. I'm Beth Henman. Um, I'll start first, Carrie, I guess. Oh, it's telling me in my meeting start. Hold on. Did I lose everybody? Beth, I think you have to like open your document first. Like go up and click on the. It's telling me, well, I'm trying to. There you go. Now you're good. There we go. Sorry, it was telling me a meeting was going to start. I thought um, <laughs> I was in a meeting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought I was there. Uh, anyway, so yeah, hi everybody. I'm Beth Henman. I'm a Spanish teacher at Westerville North High School, uh, which is just outside of Columbus in central Ohio. Um, Kathy asked me to present on interpersonal um, mode, which I th was told her, thanks a lot, Kathy. The thing everybody wants to know is how to do interpersonal in the uh, in a virtual land here right now. Um, Carrie, do you want to chime in and say hello or? Sure. Wait yeah. Till. Hi, everybody. I'm Carrie Durand. I teach French and Spanish at Mommy High School just south of Toledo, Ohio, and I have the presentational piece. Right. So we were thinking um, I would start uh, since I mean, certainly presentational can pop in at any point during a, a unit or whatnot, but a lot of times people think presentational is kind of the big finale or your summative presentational piece and whatnot. So um, I thought I would start off here today talking about uh, your interpersonal things, interpersonal mode. Um, do, 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 do. Um, a, I was funny story here. I was trying to do some my own interpersonal uh, inter experience lately, I had to email someone over in Spain the other day and I was kind of freaking out about it. it. Of all the years I've been speaking Spanish, teaching Spanish, whatnot, my own confidence was lacking as I had to email someone over in Spain trying to, um, trying to order some tiles for our house, little address tiles. And I thought, here we are asking our students to do um, interpersonal communication and putting myself in their feet sometime or in their shoes, I guess. Uh, having to do it on my own. It was a, a good reminder doing this presentation, I guess, or before doing this presentation of asking the kids to communicate in their, in their target language, uh, that confidence builder. So the things I'm gonna show you today, um, Kathy asked me to mention the standards and whatnot, uh, that interpersonal communication, uh, whether it is doing things like emails, speaking, signing, whatnot, uh, that true communication uh, is certainly a, Confidence is a huge part of it. So uh, my examples today range from novice level, intermediate level, AP. I teach two, honors two, honors three, and AP. So I've got kind of the full range, the full gamut. Um, we just reviewed, uh, rewrote the standards. Um, I'm, she always uh, likes us to review those at any, uh, if you, uh, this is your first meeting, one of these virtual hangouts, or you attend all of them, like I, I tend to take uh, my chance, my opportunity to, to take in all of them here. Um, but she wants us to certainly be aware of all of them, uh, be aware of the standards at all of them, I guess, at all times, because you know everything we tie back into, uh, or everything we do needs to tie back into those standards. Um, I'm going to, these are the novice ones, of course, they're gonna change a little bit, but the zzz, if I zip down to the interpersonal ones here, the main thing, of course, is that communication. Um, to me, as a teacher, I always, I always struggle with the spontaneous part of it. The, the goal is, of course, that spontaneous communication, where they're just having a conversation in a cafe with someone or making their needs, um, meeting their needs. They need to take a menu and order spontaneously, and then all of a sudden the waiter asks them a question and they need to react uh, without having all that uh, practice, you know, going home and writing out a skit and having a month to prepare for it or whatever. So um, <clears throat> highlighting the 
practiced and original questions at that novice level. So our goal as the teacher in the classroom, I think, is to give them lots and lots of practice so that they eventually get to that spontaneous point. Um, if you do, 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 do. Uh, interact, negotiate, meaning, communicating effectively, and things like that. So always going back to those standards, how can we create opportunities for them to um, negotiate that meaning and hopefully build their confidence like me with that email the other day building my confidence I was questioning myself is this person gonna understand me I emailed him it took forever for him to email me back and I thought to myself oh my gosh did I not say something right uh, he finally did but he didn't answer all my questions so it, it, again it, was, it took a blow to my confidence in my second language uh, writing that email to him so um, it's just, we have to constantly create opportunities for them. Yesterday, I don't know if you attended Kathy's conference um, on the um, interpretive mode, but uh, I try and work in a lot of chances for them to have some type of authentic resource where then they can build the opportunity, or give them a chance to make their interpersonal experience based on an interpretive thing, whether it's an article, a tweet, an infographic, something like that. And then I bet Carrie's going to show you in her part on the presentational piece, how you can build that into the presentational um, component as well. So all these things are certainly um, built on each other. So um, if you take it back then to mine, um, I copied here the overview. This is the overview for the interpersonal communication because I think as I said, that spontaneous part right here is the main thing. You certainly can't, I think, have the greatest expectation for your kids at the novice low, novice mid-level to just spontaneously burst out in conversation, but you're working to that at all times. So some of my examples you'll see today aren't necessarily them just, you know, sitting down and, okay, everyone, start having a conversation about your weekend and whatever, but you're trying to create opportunities where they eventually get to that point. So, but they're, you know, providing and obtaining information. So, asking and answering questions, basically expressing feelings. I always like them to give a chance to just say how they feel about something, giving opinions in culturally appropriate ways. So that's your, that is the overview from the standards there, um, what I constantly keep in mind. So, all right, so what I've created for you in my part of the presentation today is just um, a bunch of examples of how I create or give them opportunity for their interpersonal interaction. And then I know the big question on everybody's mind is, well, how do I take this to maybe the blended or online format that my district is going to put me in here in the next few weeks when we start back to school? So I'm not saying that these are the best or the you know ideal experiences, but unfortunately, it's going to be what we have to deal with. So you guys might have some alternatives to this. Um, put those in. The, I can't see the chat box right now, so um, we can add those in later. Um, some of them work really well in the blended because you have the time that is within the classroom. So you just are there doing the same thing as you would face to face because they're going to be in there. So I have some examples on some how I do um, uh, them in my class. So first one is just uh, having a conversation. I love to do this one. Um, I give them a photograph. Um, immediately then the students will just literally take the role of one of the people in the photograph. So it needs to be something with a lot of different people and then start having the conversation they think would be taking place. Sometimes they get confused on this the first time we try it. Uh, they think they're supposed to be talking about the scene, but it's not that, it's that they literally put themselves in the, con in the scene. So I usually keep it moving pretty quickly, so I cut it off before they get a chance to get run out of things to say, especially at a lower level. Um, spend less than a minute, maybe it's just 30 seconds. If that's, you know, if I see the, if I hear the conversation kind of getting to a lull, then, I, I move on to the next one. Um, in a blended uh, classroom, it would be the same as in a face-to-face -face classroom, literally, because they're sitting there having the conversation. Obviously, we'll have to be spaced out a little bit. <laughs> um, in a novice, I even was thinking how I might do this and or how you do it for the different levels. Maybe give them a picture early so they could prepare like, okay, this is the scene. I'm, you know, this is what this person might say. Um, in an in a, uh, intermediate level, maybe give them a picture, but then just do a similar one in class. So they're not having too much prep time, but it'd be, maybe it's a scene of a classroom. Um, in a total online classroom um, or format for your intermediate and advanced, um, I would might, if you trust your students well enough, have them go in breakout rooms and do this. Say, so show them the picture and then I'll say, okay, here, we're going to our breakout rooms and then corral them back in if you uh, trust them enough to do that. Um, 
that's how I would take that to the on, uh, online version. And here would be samples of pictures that I would use. I would show them one at a time. Obviously, I was smooshing them together here, but similar or familiar situations. That's the key here. Um, classroom settings. They're in, I guess, a science lab dissecting. I don't know what that is, but that's disgusting to me. But anyway, so so immediately I would show it to them, and then they would know. Okay, I'm going to be this student. I'm this student. I'm this student, and I'd give them 30 seconds. Here are some others situations that they're very familiar with and we go from there. Um, this might be one from the beginning of the year unit, maybe a getting to know you kind of one, who am I, back to school kind of thing because you can see we've got classroom settings and things like that. So um, this right here is just one of the um, benchmarks from the standards. One of the goals is to be able to communicate in spontaneous spoken, written, or signed conversations. I kind of put these in, you'll get used to seeing these This there too. Um, that's the goal, that's the benchmark. So hopefully, as their confidence would build, I wouldn't grade this. They would all just be talking with their partners in the class and we would go on from there. You obviously could change the pictures depending on the setting. You could, if you're doing a food unit, be people in a restaurant. If you're doing a sports unit, it could be, you know, teammates playing, playing the game, something like that. But I think you could modify that one pretty easily for a blended room, obviously, and for the online one too. Uh, my next one is down the line, I would call this. Uh, students make two long lines facing each other. They could be seated or standing, so you could do this out in your hallway. Um, the teacher poses a question or prompt and the students discuss that with a partner. And then you call time after 40 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, however long. Um, and then one line moves down one person, so you just shift down the line give them another prompt, and now they answer that one with their person, and so on and so on. You just keep changing the question, so they're just shifting, one of the lines moves down. Um, the time on the prompt and the activity depends on the level. For the blended, it'd be just the same, since they'd still be in the classroom. Uh, for my online, I think I might switch this one as, the students would record a response um, to, or a question to a prompt or a resource, maybe on whatever format, whatever format you'd wanna use. Um, and then the students would go, quote unquote, down the line, reacting, responding. So say you're on, uh, I'll just say Flipgrid because I use that one a lot. You would pose a question or a prompt to the class um, and the students would record their question and the response to it. And then you would instruct students to go watch another student's video and then they would record a response to it. Um, Gee, that's great. I do that same thing too. My favorite activities are this, or my favorite food is that too. And then maybe, depending on the level again, have them ask more questions about it. Uh, you could have them go back and forth several times if you wanted to, or they have to keep on going down the line and respond to five different people's uh, videos, something like that. So it wouldn't get necessarily tons and tons of feedback, but you'd still have that interaction um, going on. Hey Beth, can I, I a couple yeah. questions are popping up, mostly about sort of the logistics. So you've mentioned Flipgrid. Uh -huh. um, what are some other, Two questions. The first one, this is the first one. Like, are there other tools that you can think of that might, these might work with also besides Flipgrid? Um, you could certainly use a Padlet if you uh, wanted to have them pose a question there. Um, I was going to say that Jamboard, if you're watching your yesterday, uh, if you're familiar with Jamboard, you could have them uh, answer a question on Jamboard, uh, which is another Google suite um, product. You could, they could answer on a post it and then have students reply. Um, I don't know if you could reply with another post-it, that might get confusing, but it might be neat because you can answer on a pen or with a pen. Uh, they could respond to a question on a, on a, on a student's uh, first comment on, a, on that. You could well, do- yeah, You could have the questions in one color post-it and tell them to right. answer in a different color. That'd be good. Right. Yeah. yeah. However, to show one reaction as a response to the first person's post, something like that. You could certainly do it um, just as a question on Google, pop out a question on your Google Classroom because uh, students can reply to each other on Google Classroom if you post a question like that. Um, you know, there's a, whatever method or, you know, okay. format that you use, there are different ways to have students respond to each other. Yeah, and there's some great tools coming in the chat box for whoever posed that question. One other yeah. one, Beth, and I don't want to put you on the spot because, and, and, and also comment people, help her out with this one too, because I think none of us know yet. Have you thought about the fact of the masks at all? like you'll be wearing a mask or anything. Have you thought about that piece of it or not yet? Me wearing one or the students wearing one? Um, I think it was you wearing one. Me wearing one? 
Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm going to, I don't know how much I'm going to fight this one or not. If, I don't know if you guys are watching the governor's press conference a few press conferences ago, but he specifically said world language teachers would be an exemption to the mask thing because of the difficulties posed in trying to teach a world language. Um, I forget which press conference it was, but it was um, a few press conferences ago. So I don't know. My, I'm going to have my husband legitimately build me a little um, device. I don't know if I'm going to have him use um, um, plexiglass or a clear shower curtain or he's real handy like that. So I'm going to have him build me a little stand. I don't know if I, I, I kind of want it on wheels so I can wheel it around my room, but something to just build a barrier between myself because I'm, I'm a very animated teacher. And I know a lot of you guys probably are, if you do like a, you know, cause I'm trying to get the message across in my vocabulary and all of that. And, and I don't see how logistically I can wear one. I mean, I want to, I do, I'm not an anti-mask person, but just given our, our field and stuff. I don't know that we can wear one. Okay. So, well, well, I'll be calling on your husband too for that little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. All right. I keep told going. him. I said, <laughs> I said, Brian, you do realize when my colleagues see this, they're all going to want one. He goes, I'll, I'll give them the materials and I'll show them how to do it. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Beth. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, well, these are just examples of the kinds of things that I might post in one of those down the line kind of things. I'll just throw this out as a prompt, you know, I'll say the English ones here because I know I have all languages, but just the best thing about being a sophomore or junior, and I'll give them 30 seconds, and they just talk with their, their partner about that. The worst thing about being a sophomore or junior, whatever grade they're in. What do you do when it rains all day? It was probably a rainy day when I threw that one out. What's more important in life, sports or school? Or you can just see some of the topics. So they're just random little prompts. And then they just get 30 seconds or whatever to answer. And then they just, the one line shifts down a person. So, and that's it. That's the kind of thing. And you could obviously tailor that if you were trying to just, if you're trying to talk about a certain topic or whatever, but a lot of these interpersonal activities I'm just doing as, as I said, not necessarily tied to a specific unit, although sometimes I do, but just as a chance for us to get communicating and that's it. They have to build that confidence or they'll never be able to, um, you know, show what they know in a perform in an assessment setting. So um, my next one is kind of similar. I call this one at the bus stop. So we pretend it's literally the bus stop. So students stand apart from a small group of chairs, which would be the bus. Um, the t I would announce a group to board the bus and I would make this really random, like, okay, everybody who's wearing blue and those people get on the bus. So they would go sit in the chairs and randomly strike up a conversation. So I'll just let them talk about whatever they wanna talk about. They can chat while they're on the bus, just like you would if you were riding the bus. And then everybody who wouldn't be wearing blue would stay on the bus stop and they would just strike up a conversation with the people at the bus stop. And then after a few seconds, minutes, whatever, I'll change it up, okay, here we are, the bus stops. So then I would change it and say, okay, now everybody with dark shoes gets on the bus. So obviously some would stay on the bus because they are not only wearing blue, they also have dark shoes, but then, you know, it would change, it would mix. So I would just change it and they would talk. Um, this does work better in a little bit more advanced level, but depending on, you know, if you might have to give a little bit of direction or maybe you would throw out a topic or something if you're trying to use it in a lower level. Um, for the blended, I thought this would be awesome to do outside because literally it's a bus stop. So you could go stand wherever your buses come to school or whatnot, have kids carry some chairs outside. You could socially distance this one pretty easily, Step, se separate the bus or the seats on the bus and whatever. Plus, um, I assume for a lot of our blended options, we'll have smaller groups of students. So the blended version would work well. The online version, I uh, was thinking, post your question on a Google Classroom. I don't know, students reply to each other. I did have some trouble with this one because I thought, how are you gonna have them coming in and off? Um, in and out on that one. So I did have some trouble on this one because this is works better if you have a group of students together, but unless you were in a synchronous group or something, you could um, put them in small and put them in their rooms or whatever and, and divide it that way. That, that way that could work, I suppose. Um, I did have some trouble with that one, but as a, as a face to face or blended activity, this is a really good one. I like the, the gossiping on this one. Um, this one I love to do, just chat about a whatever, and you can, this is a great one to blend, to work in those authentic resources uh, that Kathy had yesterday in her interpretive one. 
So given some type of authentic resource, an advertisement, a promotion for a concert or whatnot, a flyer, a menu, whatever, students discuss and question. Um, this could certainly work into presentational activities such as a skit, um, maybe, I'm sure Carrie will show you some things like that. Um, in the blended classroom, since they've got time ahead of time, especially with the novice level, give them the resource early um, in their off time. Um, they could prep vocab ideas if that's you know, something you want them to do. Um, again, with the intermediate level, give them a similar one so they could again think about it or prep if you want to do some type of a prep activity, but then do a different one in the class time. Um, for the online version, students could post questions about the authentic resource and then have others, other students respond um, with their questions, you know, answer the questions, maybe post other questions if you want to keep the conversation going a little bit. Again, in whatever format, whatever format you want to use uh, for your, I don't know why I'm just leery of having the novice students break out in chat rooms, I guess, on your if you're using Google Meets or if your district lets you use Zoom or whatever, because I think they don't necessarily have the the conversation ability yet to, I don't want a bunch of freshmen in breakout rooms, I guess. <laughs> so that's why I keep saying in my intermediate and advanced, because I think they might be able to handle it a little bit better. But you could certainly do where students post a question about it or a comment at least about it and have the student respond, react. So I might do something like this as we go in for the beginning of the year, give them a back to school ad. Uh, in the target language, of course, it's a familiar thing. They would certainly, you know, this is on familiar topics back to school and back to school shopping and whatever, trying to find one in Spanish with a lot of materials and things that they would know. Oops, I thought I had another one in there. But so yeah, if you could find a similar one for the intermediate level or just give them this one, if you print off copies or show them one, share them, share one with them on a, you know Google Drive or whatever you use, Schoology and whatnot, so they could take a look at it and just sit there and chat about back to school shopping. Um, if you're low, your lower levels, uh, if you give them two different ads, sometimes I like to do that, or two different menus or something, and oh, this restaurant offers, or this restaurant has, you know, crepes. Oh, this one has fromage. I don't know. That's cheese, right? <laughs> I'm going to order the whatever, and they just have a conversation back to back, or I'm looking for a restaurant that has whatever. Oh, back to school ads. Um, let's go to this store because it has lots of pens, um, you know, I need pens, do you need pens? Yes, I have pen, you know, that kind of thing. So they go back and forth talking about the, talking about the, the resource. Um, this one I always just note in my own notes, an APAB, AP teachers know what this is. It's um, literally one of the sections on the AP test. It's a guided conversation. Um, on the AP test, on the AP Lang test, they have to uh, respond to half of a conversation. Um, the prompt is given and then they have like seconds to respond to it. Um, as the level increases, support decreases. So this is literally now how I do many of my speaking assessments, even in class. Your blended option would be identical because they'd be in the class. I would do it in the class time. For your online version, I would have them do it in breakout rooms. Um, uh, the t or the teacher could record half the conversation, just like in the AP test, and then they phone in their half on Google Voice. Um, I think that would be a great, you could certainly do that online. Uh, you could do it on there synchronously if you were trying to do it for an assessment or you know just to practice, have them do it on their own time. Um, this is what mine look like. And you could see, as, as I said, as the level increases, the support would decrease, absolutely. So. Um, this is one in Spanish 2 that I use. You can tell it's the travel unit. So one student is student A, the other student is student B. My kids get used to doing these pretty quickly. Um, you can tell them this one is very much supported because I'm, I give them a lot, of, lot to go on. Um, student A always starts. They're in the travel agency. So, you know, greet your clients. Student B responds and returns the greeting. There's always a greeting one in there. Find out where they like to go for vacation answer and tell why, react. So you can see this is not, this is an example that I was saying before about how it's not so spontaneous because it's very guided, but it helps them, it gets them into that familiarity. Um, it helps them get to that point where eventually they can do this on their own, but it's also preparing them literally and quite honestly for that part of the AP test. Um, in Spanish three, it would be much less guided. It would say like, um, just react, respond, question, things like that. So it's the worst list guided. 
Um, here's another one of the benchmarks from the standards. Request and provide information using a variety of practiced and familiar words, phrases, simple sentences, and questions. So I just kind of took that benchmark and altered that AP format. They've, they've got to get familiar and comfortable with that part to be able to, to do that. And it is a logical question. I don't know how many of our students are going to the travel agency, but you know, we do these all the time in my class. Um, we practice them. Sometimes they're assessed. Here's my, um, hold on a second. This is my Spanish three, a Spanish three assessment that I used a couple of years ago. If all goes well. So this is literally how I use it on Flipgrid. It sounds a little bit chaotic, um, but I videotape mine. So I record like my half of the conversation. I time it out. I put this on my whiteboard, the front of the room, awkwardly looking at them, waiting, 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 because the other half of the conversation now, this is when they're replying. And so then this is what they see. I'll just, here's a student. So now they're all looking at what you just saw. I'm up there on the whiteboard. <laughs> and then they all wait in there. I'm reading the other half. So and they're all panicked and waiting. So there you see what that looks like. That's how I would use the um, this so as they were <laughs> as they were waiting they have a guide like this it says something like explain why you're calling today or something like that and it was they had a problem with their cell phone or something like that so they have a problem and they're calling the customer service or whatnot so that's how i do a lot of my assessments then i just grade their flip grid their half of the conversation it's super easy and instead of calling every student out into the hallway one at a time to grade I get everybody done at once. It's kind of chaotic and noisy, but you could see I could hear them all really well. So anyway, uh, find a friend, I call this one. Uh, this is, I can do this in any level. This was a Spanish two, I think. Uh, we had, re oops, we had read an article, sorry. We had read an article, so I said after reading or an authentic resource or whatever, and it talked about like, I don't know, 40 things a typical teenager does or something like that. Um, but you could do any type of an authentic resource or whatever. I just had students respond how their life is similar. It, yours might be, I mean, it could be anything. You could say what foods they like to eat. If, if it's an article on foods in the, in the, in your target language, in your country or something like that. I don't know what movies they like or what they do in their free time, whatever. Then students pass around the room trying to find um, classmates with similar responses. This is a classic interpersonal activity. I bet many of you do these all the time. Um, I try to tie it back into the authentic resource for that little bit of cultural connection and cultural comparison. Um, blended classroom would be the same because they're in the classroom doing, um, you know, face to face. You could um, obviously have them do the authentic resource in their off time considering that maybe come up with some questions ahead of time. In the online, this is one I was really stuck on. I don't know how I would alter that for online. If somebody has some ideas, you can throw that in the chat box and I'll catch up with that later because I would like to know. Um, shoot, let me go back. Okay. So here's what it looks like. This is just a copy I made of it. So the this right here is just the list of 40 things that we studied a few days ago that was the authentic resource we had it was an article like I said on supposedly 40 things that define the modern teenager whatever so I had them make a list of five or six things that they did the weekend before um, supposedly trying to find out if they were a typical teenager so wow that's awesome you were a typical teenager haha ha. and it just says I imagine that another classmate also did similar activities so I guided them pass around the classroom asking your friends if they did those same things. So they might've set up here, you know, I play video games, I went to work, I cleaned my room, probably not, they probably didn't say that, did some homework, whatever. 
So going around the classroom, just trying to find out, um, did you do your homework? Did you clean your room? Did you go to work? Did you play video games? Whatever. Finding people that did similar things. So it's just a matter of going back to that, sharing, finding out information, and they're supposed to sign their name when they find somebody that did that. And then that cultural connection, again, going back to the authentic resource, supposedly that list of 40 things were actions that represent the typical youth. So if that's true, it says, explain why you and your friends that you found today are those typical youth. So seeing if they could connect that back to the article just for that um, connection again to make it authentic. Hey Beth, quick question. Um, uh -huh. For your flip grid where all the kids were responding, do you do that formative assessment, summative or both or? Yes, both. Okay. Uh -huh. um, a share out, here's another one for example. Um, I just call this a share out, I don't know. Teacher throws out a prompt for students to record and present. Um, encourage questions to be a part of their presentation. That's your hook for the responses. This is really important, I think, for the blended and online. Um, this, I mean, you could literally throw out a prompt for them to record anything. I use this one a lot in the springtime when we were in the online. Um, so they're presenting hobbies, they're presenting, you know, this is who I am, like an introduction video, whatever. Um, this is one, let's see. I'm hoping this all links and works. Yeah, she was presenting her adventure. I had them uh, record on Flipgrid an adventure that they had during their time in quarantine. So, Hola, Senora Montovi Bicicleta con mis hermanas, uh, Hoover Dam. Mi casa está dos milas desde Hoover y es un poco ejercicio para el día. Estoy aquí y. Uh, so yeah, they just recorded an adventure. That was their um, their share out. So she was sharing, this is her prompt and whatever. And then students, I don't know why I didn't put the uh, responses on there, but so students leave their Flipgrid, their video, whatever, and then students uh, respond to it. That's the, that's the uh, interaction, I guess. Um, this is how I used it. I do have the responses on this one, I think, hold on. Time out, time out. Yeah, this one I did better. So this is almost kind of like the going down the line one. <laughs> um, uh, oh, this one has two responses. I'll play hers here. Hola, uh, soy Olga y mi sueño o meta en futuro es... So she's sharing on this one her um, goals for the future, what kind of life she wants to have in the future. And then I had kids kind of going down the line and they had to just respond and reply back. Hola, Olga. Oh. Tu sueño es... So see, she responds back and gives her some feedback, I guess, on her dreams for the future and someone else replied too, so whatever. Um, but I think I'll build on this one, definitely. This was, you know, all things in the spring are definitely, are definitely open for, for editing, so you could certainly make them go back then and reply back and make it, maybe they have to respond to someone's presentation and then that person has to go back and reply to the replies that they got. So depending on how far you wanted to take it, you create a like video or online conversation, so to speak. Um, Skittles on this one, you might have to really watch this one um, because of the, of course, social distancing and whatnot, but it gives students a pile of Skittles on their desk um, and give a topic or category to each color. Uh, as they pick that color, whatever they have to share, or discuss a question based on the color that they get. Um, blended, I would do the same thing, of course, because it's in live and face-to-face. -face. Um, online, this one I think <laughs> would be really creative to try. You'd have to have students select ahead of time, maybe think of a deck of cards or like silverware, things like that. And teachers would call out, okay, you've got aces, okay. Students type in their prompt, their answer to the prompt, I guess. Student then call out, okay, kings. And those students that are kings then would reply to the aces comments, that kind of thing. Reply again, okay, now I want the jacks. Whoever said they are jacks, those students then reply to the kings or the aces, that kind of thing. So that it's kind of going in a round robin, uh, so to speak. I don't think I would go with Skittles because they would sit there and eat them on. You wouldn't be able to see what's going on. Um, my topics would be, 
for example, this is what I've done for the Skittles. So <clears throat> Rojo is family, if you get the red one, yellow is fears and whatnot. So for example, in my AP class, they'd be sitting around. Okay, if you wanna pick a red one, then you have to talk about um, family, whatever. Oh, my family, this weekend we did this, or my family is thinking about doing this. My family, oh, my sister left for college today. It was really sad or, you know, whatnot. Uh, and the, uh, the other people in their circle and their group have to talk and respond and ask some questions like, oh, really? Well, who's going to get her room? Because she's got the best room in your house. I've been in your house before, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you could certainly tie the topics into whatever unit you're talking about. If it's environment, technology, take it down to school things, classes. You can make red classes, yellow, after school activities, green, I don't know, um, lunch, uh, yellow or blue, I'm sorry, purple, your schedule, things like that. Um, for the UFOs, this one's a fun one to try. Honestly, I've never tried this in Spanish two, but I've done it later in Spanish three. Um, it's The kids get a kick out of this. They really feel challenged by it. Um, one partner sees a list of very strange and random words on the board. So I kind of have one partner turn to face the back of the room and the other one just looking at the board. Uh, the other partner tries to describe and circle no cute the unknown word, trying to get partner two to guess. Uh, they might know the word in the target language, maybe they don't, it's not really the point. It's not about those words, but to make yourself understood, it's completely circumlocution. Um, I think it'd be kind of fun if anybody's doing a blended option where half of the kids, the kids who are home are live streaming so they can see in the classroom. It might be kind of neat to have, you know, students pick something in the class, the ones that are there, and the kids who are live streaming have to guess what it is. Like they're describing something in the class, more of like an I spy versus a UFO for the vocab. So I guess there's two activities in one. If you're online, kind of a similar thing. Uh, one student picks an object in their home and the students have to guess what it is. Like I'm sitting here right now and I've got a giant plant sitting next to me. I could, you know, okay, I've got this object in my mind. So the other students, if you're synchronous, uh, doing a synchronous thing, the other students have to guess what it is. Um, asking questions, kind of a, an I spy thing. Um, or teacher thinks of an object. This wouldn't be a good one if you are a teacher who's got big vocab lists and things like that. Teacher thinks of an object from the vocab list and students have to try and guess what it is. Um, you could do it verbally um, or typing in questions in your, your chat and whatnot. That would be a good one to use as well. Um, this one, I was typing this up the other day, I was out on my desk. So these were things out in my backyard. This would be example of the kinds of things that I put on there. I have no idea how to say a tiki torch in Spanish, but again, that's not the point. If you were my partner, I would have the first list and I would have to describe to you a tiki torch in Spanish. My partner, if they knew the word, they could say it in Spanish. Like I said, some of these words, you know, they might know the words for spider web. They should know that word by Spanish three in Spanish, but I'm trying to describe. That one's pretty easy. I could probably say where a spider lives or the house of a spider, but still, you're trying to circumlocute it. This is great for, this is a really practical skill for them, I, you know, telling them you can't just go to Spain and give up and say, oh, you know, I need my passport. You have to describe it if you've lost it. And we all know how important that is. So this is a good one. Sometimes they get so frustrated and I tell them not everybody start as number one, because then you're going to hear someone next to you guess what it is. So everybody just start in a different place. And I usually give them a really long list and don't give them time to get through the whole list. I just say, pick one that interests you or you think sounds fun to describe or whatever. So we just go at it. They love doing this. It's, it's a fun one. Uh, tertulias, uh, this is a nice cultural one. We talk about tertulias starting in Spanish three. So they get the idea. Um, honestly, I don't know that there's such an actual practice of this in other languages, but I know, um, I was just talking to Kathy last night, you know, sitting in a cafe in France over a nice cup of coffee and bagels or something, or I don't know. Uh, no, it's not a bagel. What is it? Baguette. There you go. Wine. Oh, Wine. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Croissant. But Tertulia in Spain is this group of people that get together and sometimes they just last for years and years and they debate politics and current events and whatever. And so we do cultural readings on it and whatnot. So um, I start this concept of a Tertulia and 
So they have casual dialogues. Um, my students, here's one. I have them record it just for practice, and they literally Hola. just sit there and. 24 días hasta el Halloween. Estás emocionado? Sí, estoy muy emocionado. Sí. Uh, so, yeah, and it just goes from there. Um, sometimes we'll use it just literally for formative practice and I'll give them feedback um, other times for a literal you know a, a summative assessment or whatever just to build that confidence in having a spontaneous conversation um, blended I would do it right there if it was an advanced maybe intermediate I would have them do it in rooms again depends on the the trust of okay guys go in a breakout room and just chat in Spanish so that's up to you um, social media, oops, social media posts. I use Twitter all the time in my classes. It's a great source. It's a quick one. It's easy. I use it for warm ups and whatever. I let them gossip about it. Sometimes there are questions on a post. Sometimes there are links to follow. Uh, in the blended, I would obviously just do it in right there online, do it right there. This is an easy one to do. You might give the post ahead of time in the blended, let them prep again if you want. Um, you could gossip literally in like Google chat, if you have Google chat. Um, if you have a Twitter account for your students, some teachers have like a class Twitter, post it and then tweet about it. It'd be great, it'd be perfect. I mean, what a real life uh, thing. Uh, for example, here's one that I use around Thanksgiving. This just says it's a law of life, the rule of life. Whoever cooks doesn't have to wash the dishes. So you could let, lead that into a conversation about you know traditions around different holidays in your house, something like that. Beth, do you have just, a sorry, real quick? Do you have a Twitter for each a Twitter account for each class, or just one big one? I don't because I just pull up Twitter and put it into my classroom. But I know some teachers do. So okay. this is Bad Bunny. He's like a you know pretty important reggaeton singer, right? Singer, reggaeton artist, whatever right now. So he posts a lot, you, you, you gotta watch some of his, but these were amazing today. Here's a good example of a question, talking about a cultural comparison. I have to use this in class. It just was tweeted the other day. It says, uh, do you know a similar place? And it's talking about, you know, natural places in Spain. Do you know a similar place? So right away, it literally begs the cultural comparison right there. Tell us about it. So you could say, what, what do you guys do? Where do you go? This one has a link to um, natural, uh, natural parks, national parks in Spain. So you could literally click on the link and it's got all these na national parks in Spain. I would have the kids pick one, check it out. And then I would further this, I would have them um, check out the parks and the site. And then I would make another, um, in a, a, interpersonal activity i would make them does your park have a blank my park has a blank what would you do at your park can you swim at your park can you hike at my can park at my park and i would have them do another type of interactive activity on that it's perfect um i'm gonna have to stop because uh, carrie needs her time i just looked at the clock here um, I've got some other activities here. If you wanted to talk, um, ask me about them, you can email me. I have my email on the top slide there, but I only have a few others, but I'm out of time. So, Hey Beth, before you leave 30 seconds, we have a question about just talk really quickly about like how you set up the class, the class Twitter. Is that that? Cause you can only like invite kids in. Is that how it works to keep it private? Well, I'm not sure because I don't have one, like, but I said, I know some teachers do. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, I had one. I had one, and I I only let people had to request to join, or however you did, and I only let in my students, and it was a private account. So that's how to get around that. Okay. Right, that's absolutely what I would do. Maybe even let parents in right now, so parents, if they are nervous about it, because I know some parents, you know, social media and the kids and all that. Yeah, I would lock it down really tight, and I would watch it really carefully. But great, thanks, Beth. All right, and, and like she said, she's got tons of activities on here, so we can, we'll access that. We've been posting the links over and over, so grab those. Um, Carrie, I guess you're up. Everybody, um, share my screen. Can do this. So I have presentational activities to share with you, and I've noticed in, Wrong button. I've noticed in the chat box, it pop up several times the different, um, the link to our handouts. So 
if I can't get to everything, there are examples for everything posted in the handouts that Kathy has been posting in the chat box for everybody. So it's important to think, I think when we talk about presentational mode that we're not just talking about like a skit and we're not just talking about writing an essay or something like that. It's really every time we give our students an opportunity to show us what they know and what they can do with the language. I thought Beth did a great job showing you in the standards, the interpersonal, if you had just scrolled down just a little bit further, you would see all of the different ways you can use presentational communication based on the proficiency level of your students. And so in the handout that Kathy shared with you, I made a Google Sheet that has all of my examples that I talk about. And you can, it's a view only, so you can go in and you can filter by the type of activity or the level that your students are at, you know, novice low or novice mid, novice high or into the intermediates. Whether or not you need technology to do that, like a yes or a no or a maybe. If it's something that you could use for writing or speaking or both, because really if you can write about it, you should be able to talk about it. And if you can talk about it, you could write about it. A quick description and then a link for you to see an example of it. But all of those examples are also right there in the folder that is shared. Two important things that I think we think about when we're talking about inter or presentational rather communication is how to score them, especially in the blended and maybe online learning that's going to have to happen. You're wondering to yourself, how am I going to score this? How am I going to give them a grade? You really don't have to make it harder than it has to be because Kathy and Ryan and the team at ODE have done such a great job putting together those rubrics already for you. So if you just go to the ODE website and you can literally type into the Google search bar ODE world language rubrics and they're right there. So that's done for you. You don't have to worry about that. You can worry about the things that haven't been done already. And then another important piece I think to remember is that presentational communication doesn't happen in isolation in authentic contexts. Like my presentation didn't just pop into my head. Like I had interpersonal communication with Beth and with Kathy and with colleagues from my school and I did a lot of interpretive reading and listening to put together to find information to put into my presentation. So all of those really great interpersonal things that Beth just got done talking about once they're done communicating with a partner or once they've watched somebody's Flipgrid you can have them write to you and say I watched so and so's I watched Becky's video, Becky likes pizza. And that's, that's presentational communication. It doesn't have to be like 17 PowerPoint slides with four pictures each. They just have to use their language to show you what they know. So I'll get off my soapbox and I'll show you some examples. Um, the first example that I have is a word cloud, which is something that students can create at a, even the novice low or novice mid level. And there are, I'm sure, dozens of websites that you could use if you were more tech savvy than I am to put this together. I just used a Google drawing because we have, we're a Google app school and it's easy and free. And you can have them just, your novice level students just put together words. I used words that describe my personality and they can highlight things or change the color to show how true something is about themselves or how false it is. Um, and then to add another level to make your more complex for your more intermediate or advanced students, you can have them talk to you about it and tell you, oh, I am athletic because I play soccer. And then they're moving from just word level communication to really a pretty complex sentence. Another way that students can show us what they know is through creating their own infographic. Um, they can use words and phrases at the intermediate or the novice level and bump it up to sentences at the intermediate sort of level. And they can use pictures that they curate from the internet or if you're face-to-face -face, or maybe you're not as a tech, your school district isn't as technology, technologically advanced, they could just draw pictures and then write words or write sentences. It doesn't have to be high tech all the time. A children's book is probably one of my favorite presentational writing activities because it sort of it normalizes or makes students feel more comfortable about 
writing at the level in the target language that they're actually supposed to be at. Especially, I think, with high school students, you tell them they have to write about something, and then they think, oh, well, I should be able to write in Spanish at the same level I can write in English because I'm, it's all writing, but it's not all writing. And so by adjusting the task to make it, oh, you're writing, like I'll show them a picture of my five-year-old and say, okay, you're writing a book that Alice can read. So you have to make sure that you keep your, your language, you know, words and phrases because she's not, a, she's not a great reader yet. So do it for her. And that sort of makes it more acceptable in their mind. Like, oh, it's not that I can't write. It's just, she told me to just write sentences or words. And so I have some examples um, of what those might look like. So if you're teaching a unit about foods and they have to make a book about healthy foods. And so you think, okay, is it healthy or is it not? And it's just a picture and a word. Like your novice low students could 100% do that. Whereas your intermediate level students, students who are writing in simple and maybe even some complex sentences can write you some sentences and include pictures to show you that they like they actually know what they're talking about but there's no need there's not that sort of um i don't want to say compulsion but they don't they don't need to feel Ooh, what am i doing how did you do this beth you were much better at this than i am um they don't feel like they need to use google translator they don't need to cheat because you just told them to make like words and they can make words without needing that extra help a poem is another way that they can share with you what they know. And that, I mean, it's not a lot of writing, so it's not overwhelming. And a novice student can use words and chunks of language and memorized expressions to tell you what they think about things. And then your more intermediate or advanced students can use, you're using whole sentences and you're working with rhyme and the number of syllables. And they're showing you that they understand what they're talking about through the images that they choose. You could use an invitation or a weather report also to present information. Those are things that are presented. Your novice level kids can fill in the blanks. I mean, we've all seen those birthday party invitations where it says who the party is for and there's a blank. And so then they just tell you who the party is for. Um, and a weather report is another way for them to use those memorized phrases and chunks of language in like maybe your level one or your novice low or your novice mid classes. And then you can just bump up the requirement to make it a more challenging task. Trading cards are another way that you can have students present information. Maybe it's Hispanic Heritage Month or maybe you know, you're making trading cards of your classmates and information about them. Your novice low and novice mid students can just fill in the blanks. Like you could print them and have them just fill in the blanks. And as you move up a level, then your students are writing in simple sentences. And as you move up even further along that path to proficiency that we talk about, then you're navigating past and present tense and you're changing between descriptive past and completed actions. And it's still the same task, but it's, it's more challenging for a more challenging level. A picture talk or a picture write where students are just telling you about what's in the picture. You can have them write or you can have them record themselves or even have them just talk to you in class. Your novice level students are just listing things that they see in the picture. Whereas your more advanced or intermediate students are writing you sentences and strings of sentences about what they see in the picture. My students love memes, and so I thought that you could have them, you would give them the picture of a meme and have them add in the sentence or the phrase that goes with it. I thought that might be maybe better suited for novice high and up because most memes, I think, are sentences. I don't think I've ever seen one that's just a word, but it's sort of like it's timely and it's um, something they might not mind writing about. And then the last example that I have in the slides is talking about a recipe or a menu where you show them a list of foods and you, or a picture of foods and they write about the foods that are in the, men, in the recipe or on the menu or foods that they like on the menu or foods that they don't. And again, your novice level students are just making a list of words like, they, oh, I see potatoes, I'm going to write potatoes in Spanish, or I see 
flower. So I'm going to write flower or whatever. There's no flower in this picture, but. Hey, Carrie, quick question. Oh, um, yeah. And you may, if you're getting to this, just tell us and, and we'll just let you keep going. What do you do after the kids submit all these cool things? What do you do with them? Or is that coming up still? Um, what do I personally, I, that's actually not, that's a great question. I would, <laughs> I'm not sure what I would do with them. I think I could share them with, I might, if there was an exceptionally good one, I would send a screenshot of it to their parent and say, yeah. look at what your kid can do. They could go um, back to interpersonal with them too, right? They could go back and. Yeah, for sure. Like you look at somebody else's yeah. and respond to it or ask them a question for your more advanced kids. Like, oh, it says athletic. Do you, what sport do you play or something like that? You could make sort of like a portfolio or some sort of gallery. If you were in your classroom, like, like your in-person classroom, you could put, um, like hang them up all over the wall and then have the younger, if you teach multiple levels, have like the younger kids look and see and then what boards you recognize and which upperclassmen do you think this is or maybe something like that. Um, and then this is just an example of what that same recipe activity would look like at an, um, a more advanced level. And just some things to think about wrapping it up and moving on is that it um, you should not, I don't think anybody should ever feel bad about reusing a resource. If you use the same picture in level one and level four, like your level one kids are not going to call or text or tweet your upper level students and say, we use the same picture. Can you believe she's such a, like no one is going to feel bad about you reusing a picture. And if you have the same students level one and two and three and four, you can show them like, hey, look, remember when we, you made a presentation about food in level one and you said like potato and now you've written like this beautiful paragraph about a tortilla de patatas and look at how much you've improved. So that's, I think, maybe to answer your question too, another way you could use them is if you have the same students or even in, within your department, you can save those kind of artifacts and then Ideally, at the end of the four-year sequence, you can say, look at what you, look at what you can do. It might be really motivating for the kids. Um, and to keep it simple, like there are so many great tech ways for you to have kids make presentations and like things flying in and videos and all of these things, but it doesn't have to be like complicated for it to be good. The Google suite of like slides, docs, sheets, and drawings, like it has everything you already need. Like you don't have to go, you've got enough stuff you've got to worry about right now. Just use, just use slides, just have them make a picture in slides. And last, but I think probably the most important is to really familiarize yourself with the standards because sometimes like we want more out of the students than what they're really capable of giving us. And they want to give us more oftentimes than what they're really capable of giving us. And their parents for sure expect, you know, why can't my kid read this book? Well, sir, it's like the beginning of Spanish too. So that novel really isn't appropriate. And so by familiarizing yourself and all of the sort of stakeholders involved, you can keep everybody's expectations, I think, manageable. I talked really fast, sorry, but I wanted to make sure there was time. Um, if Beth wanted to go back, I don't know if Beth, if you want to go back and show the rest of your things, um, or if anybody has any other questions or any other things that, you know, we want to talk about as a group. I think I'm um, just okay, following. Yeah. Oh, or sorry. questions. Kathy, it's up to you. Um, yeah, just a comment. And then, yeah, if there's any questions that, or if anybody, you know, wants to ask some specific questions, I think the good thing about what you're doing is, is you're showing ways that you can use one resource or one task across a bunch of different proficiency levels, especially if you have a lot of preps this gives you the opportunity instead of coming up with four different activities you're coming up with one activity and the kids have just different levels it's a great way to do that when we talked about the udl and the differentiation where different especially now where kids aren't all in the same class if they're remote seeing what each other's doing is that you give them the level to work on and they go with the level they are versus everybody feeling like oh my gosh i'm using words and they're using sentences um and i think that i'm just trying to go through Oh, here we go. Somebody had a question here, and, and, and anyone jump on, um, about bringing these products to the larger community, and that's sort of where we get into that PBL. Um, I don't know, Beth, or, or anybody in the comment box? 
about um, taking these to a larger community? I mean, I think if you had like a class website where you could share like information with the larger community or like I'm, the first thing that popped into my head was like, if you're doing a foods unit, you could share the information about like culturally, like foods that are different in the target culture with younger kids or elementary or junior high kids to try and get them excited about learning about your culture. Like I can picture a fourth grader being like, oh, I, when I get to high school, I'm going to take Spanish because I watched this video where this kid showed me about this thing and he, he was so cool and I want to be like that. That might be a way to share it, but I don't know how authentic that really is. Yeah. Or just sharing them with like different classes. If you took the names off, like if everybody made memes and then you swapped it with a different class or like the activities like Beth was doing where you went down the line and had to answer with a post-it and then just use it with a different class or something too. That might be kind of fun. Yeah, what, uh, whoever asked that question, it's off the screen there. What do you mean by larger community? Do you, how big of a community do you mean? Like your town, the school, classes? I mean, I do a lot of, I do a lot of projects. Um, I'm starting to think I'm more PBL than I knew I was. So <laughs> a lot of my final things end up out in the hallways and whatnot. And we, I invite the school community to participate, check it out, assess, visit. Uh, we invite other, um, you know, classes, teachers, whatever, even outside my department, a lot of times I invite other people to participate and whatnot in what we do. So it depends, I guess, on what you meant by community. I invite parents in a lot of times to check things out, final presentations or whatever, or when things are revealed and whatnot. Um, so sometimes, sometimes they're just out there and people have to deal with it. Um, Kathy used to teach in my building and unfortunately her room was right in the area that a lot of my stuff ended up in. So she had to participate in it, whether she liked it or not. <laughs> so, you know, we did a lot of um, day of the dead altars in my French class. Yes. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of things are out there. I, I call that area the cemetery of the school. So, but yeah, I think another thing is if you were at our, one of our very first seminars on PBL is one way to start with a project-based learning or problem-based learning is you have the students actually look around them on the way to school or look around their house or look around their community. I know things are a little, you know, always a little different right now with the COVID thing but ask them to look around and find a problem that needs to be solved and come up with a way to solve it. Like, you know, if there's some issue that someone in their family has, and, and even if it's like, okay, I'm going to create something. And again, it all depends on the language level, of course, but create something to solve a problem or a sign or something. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of the foundation of where you get these things to present to the greater community is you have to have, you find a need for the greater community to make it actually work. Just throwing out some ideas too. I think one thing too, I always constantly invite all my administrative team, vice principals, athletic director, everybody to come and check out the final projects and products or whatever, because I think it builds a little bit of advocacy on the part of administration for world languages, because a lot of times nothing against my admin team, but you know, we're the forgotten or a forgotten department so I think anytime I can get them to see come in and check out what we're doing um, it helps even if it's just something really cool it doesn't have to be a final thing but just hey check out what we did or what we're doing or come see what students are today I constantly am inviting admin, admin into my classroom to see what's going on I recommend that cool other questions we're getting tons of thank yous in the box both of these were great these were practical they were hands-on most of them can be um, used blended or and again, a lot of these, can, there's a lot of suggestions. These can be offline too. Um, about why do they care? Right. Okay. So somebody's asking how to do breakout rooms. I don't want to do it because I don't want to make you disappear. But when you're the moderator in Zoom, um, you have the more button on the bottom. It has like three dots and it says more. And there's a button that says breakout rooms. And when you hit the word breakout rooms, it will say like, how many do you want? And so if I'm like, okay, there's a hundred people, I'm gonna do 10. I think you can do up to Lucas and maybe you can help me out. Is it 50 breakout rooms or something like that? And then it literally would just put you, you get a, a thing that pops up that says join, you click join. And then I go into just a Zoom session with like four people. 
And then when you're the moderator, you just, um, you can send a message to everybody that'll say like, end the session. And then everyone in the small rooms will get something that says like, your session is ending in 60 seconds. And then they're automatically brought back to the main room. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, thank you. Yes, you have to make sure on your moderator panel that you've set up to be able to go to breakout rooms. Okay. I don't see any other questions, just lots of thank yous. Okay, cool. Um, and lots of ideas. Yes, you can have up to 50 breakouts. Okay. Um, all right. I, like I said, uh, or Beth, did you have anything else you wanted to add from yours? Um, nope. Just all my stuff is on my thing, so. Okay, cool. Well, thank you both. This was wonderful. Great practical ideas. Some of you have been posting again about, I don't know what to do with my novices. I don't know what to do with my novices. Um, Melissa, hang I don't, they can't record in the breakout rooms. That's the one. They can screen share, but they can't record. So like I said, in our August 11th, 12th, and 13th, I think it's August 12th, we're going to do some breakouts where it's literally just like brain dumps. And one of them is, what am I going to do with my novice learners on the first day of school? And one of them is going to be, let's just, everybody just do a brain dump of, I keep saying that. Everybody just give any idea you can for remote. So look for those on August 12th. Okay, cool. It looks like I think we're good. All right. All right. I'm going to stop recording then.